Hello, and welcome to Series 4 of the podcast series Exploring Music, where we explore the obscure, where we delve in deep into the vast vaults of great but maybe not so known music and the industry that, for better or worse, supports it. For each episode, we bring together two music industry professionals to discuss in depth an area of music or the industry that they are passionate about and have a first hand knowledge of. My name is Lionel Lodge, and I will be your reluctant moderator, preferring to let my guests do most of the talking. The conversation in this episode was recorded in January 2020. Since that time, there has been considerable efforts made to address the issues discussed. I believe this makes the points made even more relevant. For this episode, which is titled Diversity, we are very fortunate to have with us Alison Wenham and Stuart Dredge. Alison Wenham has worked in the music industry for over 40 years and is one of the most experienced and well-known international practitioners in the business. Founding AIM, which is the Association of Independent Music in 1999, she has been chairman and CEO since inception. Alison developed AIM's strength and visibility in representing the British music industry SMEs at a political level, working closely with government departments to shape and advise on legislation relevant to the industry. Prior to founding AIM, Alison was MD at BMG Conifer International UK, having sold Conifer Records to BMG in 1994, which Conifer Records, under her direction, had grown to be the UK's largest independent record and distribution company in the specialist music field. In 2006, Alison was elected as founding chairman of WIN, the worldwide independent network comprising of 25 independent trade associations representing thousands of independent music companies globally. She is a founding board member of Impala, the European organization representing the interests of small record companies and publishers in Europe, a fellow of the Royal Society for Arts, was a founding board director of Merlin, the independent global rights licensing agency, and also UK Music, the body representing UK music industry. She attends PPL and VPL board meetings and sits on a variety of government and industry committees. In 2006, Allison was inducted into the MMF Roll of Honor, and in March 2009, she was presented with a Special Achievement Award by Music Week for 10 years of AIM. She has featured in Billboard's Top Women in Music every year since publication. In 2010, Allison was honored with an OBE. In 2011, she was awarded the prestigious Order of Arts and Letters by the French government for services to culture. Welcome, Alison. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. And joining Alison is Stuart Dredge. Stuart Dredge is a journalist with 20 years' experience covering technology, games, the music industry, and children's media. He writes the Music Alley's daily news bulletin and contributes to the company's fortnightly report, as well as joining in on the Music Alley TV show on YouTube. Plus, Stuart writes weekly for The Week Junior, a bi-monthly mobile games column for The Guardian, and features for The Observer and Medium. Twice a year, he does blogging and socials for Read Mitem at its MIP TV and MIP Calm television industry conferences. Stuart also has a new site focused on children's tech called Contempo Play. Past freelance clients include The Sunday Times, CNET, Medium's Q Point, Stylus, and T3. Welcome, Stuart. Hello, yeah, thank you also. I'm really genuinely excited about this chat. Great, great. Today, I believe we're going to be exploring diversity. Well, yeah, I mean, diversity, when you start to apply it, it becomes quite meaningless because you can apply it to virtually any situation. And obviously, at the moment, the big association with diversity is about the gender imbalance and the lack of inclusivity. And there's been some brilliant research done in the last 12 months to show that the industry is changing, but it needs to embrace change at a much faster rate. And I think the music industry has a great opportunity to do that and to be a leader of change in that way but more broadly I think diversity is all about the changes that have taken place in the whole of the music industry I mean I've been in the industry for 40 years so I've seen how it grew from a cottage industry to where it is today 
And I think it's fascinating, hmm. the journey it's been on, where it got to, where it got stuck, and where it's now going. And so diversity is very much about markets, market access, the choice for artists, as well as this more specific issue about gender balance or imbalance. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it, I suppose, because diversity is now one of those words that seems to get some people very cross, like the Piers Morgans of the world who mm. who are sort of currently having a moment in the media of, of railing against woke culture and diversity and inclusion. And they get very cross. But like, if you take it back to what the word is, diversity is a positive word. It's it's better than all one things being the same, whether it's music, whether it's gender. It's, it's Yeah, you know, and it, it's opposite is adversity. Mm. I was right. thinking about diversity, economic diversity, cultural diversity, social diversity. I mean, you know, industrial, it's a prism. And so the word is rather unhelpful as a title. So we're going to talk, I hope, about the music industry as a whole, because that's my sort of university challenge subject. <laughs> and then we'll probably have a look at some of the specifics within it. But is this something in this day and age, like you were mentioning earlier about the whole situation with the Grammys and how statements that have come out, most people go, well, that's appalling. If that's really what's going on, if that old boy school, if that sort of thing is happening in there. And it's in a lot of the news now. Yeah. And I think there was a, not too long ago where it would have been just accepted, well, that's the way it is. But now it's saying, well, that's not acceptable. You know, well, it, it, is, it, it has been the way that it has been. I mean, it's been my career, spending my life in rooms full of white men. Mm -hmm. And I never quite understood it. I didn't know what I was doing there, but I also didn't know why they were all there and where was everybody else and why had I found myself in this position but you battle on you know you bravely go on and because I've always felt that to have an opinion and not to voice it is to let everybody down mm -hmm. I think if you have an opinion you sort of have a responsibility if you thought it through and you you can justify it mm -hmm. then you have a responsibility to put it across mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the limiting factors that women have come up against in the past that they felt intimidated by the environment and it is intimidating let me sure. tell you and I think you know the latest fallout with Naris and uh, the Recording Academy speaks to this entrenched you know there's a thing about conscious and unconscious bias and you won't catch a single smart person in the industry trying not to sound cool about you know empowerment and, and female advancement but the unconscious bias is I think very deeply ingrained mm -hmm. and I think that that's what needs to be flushed out and I think this Naris thing will flush that out. It feels like an interesting moment doesn't it as well because you've got these different things bumping up against one another so yeah. I feel well here in the UK just from going to conferences and going to companies it feels like there is a generation of people coming into the industry who are just much more diverse yeah and they're kind of bumping up against these elements of the industry that maybe that old boys club with doing which is not to say that all men of a certain age you are up a terrible that's that's not his at all but i was thinking about this a couple of years ago there was an industry conference a big industry conference and it really hit home to me there was one of the music schools music colleges had brought a bunch of students over yeah and I think they... The, oh, the, I, was, I was at this one. I'm carefully not saying who it is at what yeah, conference. Yeah. Because the lead was saying, I think it was about 60, 40 women to men. Yeah. And that was the reflection of what the course, the intake is. Yeah. And they had all had these horrible tales of bumping up against Uncle Disgustings who'd been chatting them up inappropriately or, yeah. or dismissing them. And so these young women had come along to this conference thinking, the music industry is going to yeah. be great. And they kind of they'd experienced uh, the less appealing parts of the art garden. And that seemed to set the two things that you have coming into industry this is ex exciting. But there's, I don't know, I don't want to say like an oyster in the grip, but it's like this friction of mm. people who are threatened by it or just can't stop carrying on in the old way. I don't think that is exclusive to the music industry in any way. I think it's all yeah. industries. Yeah. A lot of men in position of powers do take their power <laughs> and you have hold it over other people. I agree. I was about to say this, that very same thing. I think the entertainment industries are probably under the spotlight because of the Weinstein case, which I call willy waggling. Mm. Um, <laughs> which is essentially what it is, you know, that's really what it is. 
when you strip it away and you take all of the glamour and the power and it's basically some poor sad guy who thinks he can use a position to you know to to have some sex with a young vulnerable woman that's what it's about and when you strip it away it's a bit sordid and rather unsexy isn't it and if you want pathetic in, in many ways mm. it's just a, a bit pathetic, pathetic a bit pathetic sad character. but i think the music industry because we are culturally fast moving diverse very close to the ground and smart i think the music industry should lead the way and can lead the way it can yes and the other thing about the music industry is that we've got as you say we've got a, a lot of kids coming into the industry but they're coming in smart mm. they're coming in trained i've always thought that there's a quite a, a funny inflection between music activity the music industry because music is a universal language and has been going for millennia um, and then we harnessed it and turned it into an industry but we tend to forget that outside of that or that big gray area in the middle is a huge amount of music making and music education and music literacy that turns into an ambition to become part of the industry so they come in trained a lot of them or certainly much more enabled to work in all of the new opportunities than I was I mean you know I didn't know what publishing was for about 10 years I didn't honestly know what it was. I had that for the first two years of writing for Music Hello, and I said, could someone explain publishing to me eventually? Yeah. It's complicated too. It is complicated. To get into all the different rights. Yeah. We had it today, though. We were talking at Music Hello. We regularly have an intern from one of the music colleges. And I think our current intern has just started. I think she's been doing data science research as part of her degree. So we're saying, OK, great, she's here for three months. Like, can we do some data science stuff? And I'm there going, I've not studied data science. This is brilliant. Like, yeah, someone yeah. who can help us understand this. Like, so people come in with yeah fantastic these skills and these absolutely knowledge. fantastic so you know this this kind of old school thing that you were saying that you know they're there but that will change people will move on and people will step away from the industry because their age will determine that they've got you know other pastures to mm-hmm. go to huh. like retirement um, and hopefully maybe, the younger generations yeah are more open yeah i more. think so i think so yeah and you can also i mean it's the exciting thing and I've, I've seen people talking about this is if you're we once got criticism because I think we mentioned that phrase pale, male and stale in some of our writing. Absolutely. And someone wrote in and said, oh, actually, I'm a, a man in his late 50s. You know, yeah. And I've, I've been trying to change the culture in my company. And just, you know, I don't feel stale. I feel like I'm helping. Yeah. But I feel a bit sensitive about that phrase because it's almost like if you are pale, male, you are stale. Yeah. Well, the um, trouble with all of this is it's a sort of blunt instrument approach, isn't it? And, you know, the pale, male thing. Um, I think it's a generic. It's 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 unfair and it's unhelpful. But it's quite exciting. You can be pale and male, and you can be you can be doing exciting things with mm, terms I know, of change your company. I know, like I you know. can be the you can be the person helping this change for the better, rather than mm. fitting a tax. Like like a lot of this being the press, you obviously feel attacked when people mention diversity and inclusion. And... Yeah, I mean, there's not just about the female male thing. There's also You've seen Vic Bain's report, which I thought was really excellent, really well researched. Sorry, what was that? Vic Bain wrote a report that was published last year, which looked at the gender imbalance across the entire industry, from songwriters to executives in the industry, and found that consistently women were um, severely underrepresented. And it actually starts right at the signing point, at the point of A&R signing. It's a one in five or something like that so you know why that is I don't know the science behind that I absolutely don't know I think you need an anthropologist to look at that but there certainly is a sort of a this is the conscious unconscious bias thing I think we do tend to be unconsciously aligned with our own tribe and that probably goes for women as much as men you know so in the signing of acts to record companies it starts there 21% 21% something like that yes. I'd have to look at Vic's report to get the actual numbers but if but you did, go did, back did, in did history he a, did he have an idea of why did he have any explanation to this Vic's a she um, oh she sorry uh, okay Vic <laughs> yeah she. she's I don't think it's Victoria yeah. um, well if you go back in history you'll find that actually the roots of this are there then that that writing music was considered a male occupation 
playing music prettily was considered a female occupation in the gentrified class. But writing music, women were actively discouraged. I mean, if you look at... The classical um, era, the, how many female composers... Well, they wrote they under pseudonyms quite often. Right. The same with George Sand. You know, in the, in the literature world, you know, women who were serious about writing novels had to do so with a male pseudonym. To get taken seriously, you could not walk through the door of a publisher in London as a woman in the 19th century. So it goes back a long way, this kind of idea that music, the robust activity of, of, of culture, writing songs and writing books, is a male preserve. Kind of weird, that is. Yeah, it? isn't it? <laughs> kind of weird. It's strange. Thing. But mentioning the, re the research, that's one of the points I was thinking about, which is I feel like there's a different a bunch of different ways to promote diversity about the industry. We're talking about like people within the industry, across gender and across ethnicity. We're talking about artists in the charts, artists in the, in the streaming charts, talking about songwriters. But all these things now, we're talking about them, but we also have data. So there's that USC Annenberg study that came out this week about, I think that's studying the Billboard chart in the US. So it had exactly the same figures as Vic. Yeah. I noticed the similarity was striking. Yeah. Something like a one in five, 21%. It was, yeah. yeah you got country, someone studying the country airplay and saying, well, this, these arguments now, it's not just a sense of this is how it is, but hard data saying, that seems really to me that there's stuff that when you say, oh, it's not a problem, it's not as bad as you think, yeah. people can say, no, here are the figures, yeah. and then here's what they show. That seems to be good to us. You know, but what's really great is that there are lots and lots of organised and semi-organised groups addressing the knowledge gap, the, the, the gender imbalance. She said so, Small Green Shoots, My Own Women in Music Awards and the work that we do around that. Mentoring, I'm doing public speaking workshops because I think women have expressed real lack of confidence in speaking up in public. Mm -hmm. And if you find that challenging, I think you're going to be self-limiting mm -hmm. in your career. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying I've, I have never trained as a public speaker, but I've had to do so much of it. But, and, but you also have confidence in your thoughts. And you, you come, you I had determination. You yeah. know, once I had thought something through, and with my board aim and my board at win, when we had agreed a position, it was my job to put that across because I ran the trade association for hundreds and thousands of companies whose own commercial interests were perhaps best kept away from the position that the sector as a whole was taking. So that was my job and it had a huge commercial sensitivity. But thankfully I was not affected by the commercial outcome. I needed to influence the commercial outcome for others to benefit. Mm -hmm. So I had to have the bravery, and it, it did take a lot of balls, as I think we call it, to stand up and do that. But th th that in itself is a funny way of putting confidence. It related to the male genitalia. Yes, I know, right? because that's what yeah, that's what my board once actually went into the press and, and said she's got balls of iron or steel yeah, or something but like it's, that. It's a funny I know, idea I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. How did you feel at the time? Did, you, did that make you feel proud <laughs> or did that make you feel... Like, how, how did you feel being described? Well, it related to a, a sense of unease I've had for many, many years about why I was the only woman in the room at the BPI, why I was the only woman in the room at PPL, and so on and so on and so on. And the only thing I could sort of comfort myself with was this idea that I had a point of view, I had, I had a position on issues concerning the industry. I mean, at the time, we were being beaten up by the government badly over pricing, CD pricing and a few other things. And I ran a company which made very high-end specialised repertoire. So if I had been forced to drop my prices to 4.99, which was what Gerald Kaufman was keen to see the industry do to fall in line with his own consumption requirements, <laughs> then I would have gone out of business. Simple as that. I could not sustain because the volumes that we used to achieve were quite small, but rather like Hendrix Gin at the beginning of its life. I mean, it's now Hendrix Gin is a universal success, but at the beginning of its life, it had a little tag around the bottle and it said, it said, universally liked by a handful of people around the world. That's me. That's, that's what I did, you know. So it was loved by a small handful of people around the world. And, you know, we used to make very, very specialist repertoire for 
handful of people another, but enough people for me to make a decent successful right. business mm-hmm. and pay my artists and pay our uh, staff you know and, and run a but successful the government oh, this is something I missed I'm actually British even though I don't sound it uh-huh. but I've spent most of my life outside of England yeah. and so there was a point where the CDCLs where the government was actually stepping into absolutely Gerald Kaufman was a Labour left wing minister very influential and which did a report saying that CDs were overpriced. Rip off Britain, it was rip off CDs. But it was all around the world. It was Well, I mean, I, yes, it was. Well, we tend to be the pointy end of these things because the Anglo-American axis, I'm sure in America it was the same, but we rip off CDs. That's where it started. They did a report which was hugely misleading about the inflated profit margin of the record companies in CD format. I was so outraged about this that I wrote a real furious letter to the Guardian saying that he clearly didn't understand the market and that if you were to buy a bottle of blended whiskey at Tesco's, you would expect to pay £10. But if you were to buy a single malt from a tiny distillery, you would expect to pay 10 or 20 times more. Mm. And that he had put the price on the bottle and not the contents. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that, that yeah. and then that's what he'd done. He'd just taken the CD format and looked at the manufacturing costs, which they'd put at whatever it was. They completely blindsided the recording costs. So if you take... And also besides that, the quality of the artist and the years the artist has put into it and... Absolutely. I mean, it does not put any value on the blood, sweat and tears economy, you know, of getting there in the first place. But if I was a singer with my guitar sitting here now, we weren't having this nice chat, but we were making a recording, the costs would probably be a thousand pounds. Whereas when I put the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra into a studio with a conductor and an engineer and a producer, I'm probably not going to get out there for less than fifty thousand pounds. We'd struggle to get on this sofa as well, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you're right. The, the cost equivalence is, is drastic. Well, I come from a perspective of what business is that of the governments. That's my perspective. My point precisely, Lionel. I said, you know, shouldn't you be more preoccupied with children's shoes and the price of bread and the things that people have to have? Yeah. In Education their lives. systems, roads, trains. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, anyway, it was a kangaroo court. Right. It was a monopolism mergers commission inquiry, though. I mean, it was. A, it was a. Really? It was. Oh yes, it was a very serious thing. So I wrote this letter to the Guardian, and then I got a call from the BPI. Uh, saying, we saw your letter, we think it's brilliant, would you come in? And then they wanted me to run for the council, which I did, and I got on. Mm. So that, but that was the first time I stepped into an industry setting as opposed to a company setting. And that was the first time I stepped into a room that was, as I say, this blanket wall-to-wall powerful white men. And I guess you, I mean, was that, you, were, di- you were diverse in terms of the music you were representing then, in terms of the room. I guess the room was representing different kinds of... Everything, yeah. Yeah. Everything. One thing I've noticed, and I think this is something Laura Baker here deserves a lot of credit for, Sammy Andrews as well. I think there was this, was it three years ago, I think, they started talking about conferences, not just, ma- no, had no manuals. Well, that, that was us. Speaking. That was, was AIM, yeah, no, yeah. no more manuals. AIM, yeah. And I think we're having that effect now where three years later, there's so many conferences that actually, there's so many people who have spoken, who've got experience speaking, yeah. that now when we're trying to find people for our conferences, it's a real difference and you find that there are people who are, who are experienced, who have spoken, who are confident. But well, it took them to I, think, get that I think we, me and Lara, can take full credit for that yeah. because uh, I'll tell you where that comes from. We decided that we would not anymore present the industry in the way that it traditionally seemed to present itself, which was as, as, a, as an all-male lineup on panels. We felt that it was... Um, seriously compromising the opportunity for change mm-hmm. and if you pres- what you present is what people see then you're confirming your the these kind of old patterns of behavior so we said no more manuals but that proved to be far more difficult in the reality mm-hmm. because Lara would contact 10 men to be the 50 percent and 11 would accept mm-hmm. and she'd contact 10 women and one would accept and so we sat down and I said well you guys found the same thing that I did. 
And so I said, well, we've got to do something about this, which is when I started doing public speaking workshops to help, and they're very practical. You know, they look at preparation, they look at managing your nerves, they look at the entitlement, the right to be speaking on a panel about the subject, to build confidence. And I'm really proud of what she and I both have done there because I've done that workshop now probably 50 times and the feedback I get consistently is just amazing and I do with some fairly senior people as well I mean one story it, she was you know, a very senior manager and in a very senior industry position as well as a, a manager and she hadn't spoken on a, a panel since 1990 something when she was invited to speak in the city and there was no briefing beforehand, no preparation, five minutes in the green room. And when she turned up, the moderator said to the three guys, he said, right, he said, I want you to talk about Durin and I want you to talk about relationships with record labels. And I want you to talk about, oh, in love, I want you to talk about the work-life balance with your kids and all. <gasps> oh, no. She couldn't say a word. I want to say I'm shocked, but... Uh... <laughs> she couldn't say a word. How you manage, how you manage your life with... Your kids. She Jesus. couldn't say... You know, and wh when she, was that? That was in the 90s, and yeah. she has not appeared on a public panel since then. So she came to one of my workshops. She did a keynote speech the following week, mm -hmm. and she smashed it. Wow. Because I think that you just need to reorder your self-image to give yourself permission, to give yourself the right to shine and to be seen to shine. Because we do have a habit, us women, of expecting other people to come up and say, you've done a great job. We don't say it to ourselves. And, right. uh, you know, I, I do believe that, that that is a general human thing that we oh, under, underestimate our own abilities yeah. and we you know I, I'm the same I have lots of male friends that are the same that don't really feel that they, they're up to the job sometimes uh. and it's good to have somebody else say oh, that was really good but in uh. the for, from the male to female side I can appreciate that it must be quite intimidating because it's so entrenched mm -hmm. yeah I think it was a really important moment though because not just because what you were doing was you were raising the issue, I think, and it became embarrassing to have a manual because it would be called yeah. out. Yeah. Then, but you were booking speakers and you were training people. And I yeah. think now, three years on, certainly when I look at some other parts of the world, conferences, I think UK conferences, it's, it really is diverse now when you go to a conference. Absolutely. That's a good thing. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't be seen credible mm. if you were running a UK conference and fielding what would have been routine 10 years ago. I think AIM's done a brilliant thing by banning panels at the next AIM they have, they? Yeah, no, I think we've kind of done the panel format. And I'm really looking forward to you know seeing what change. they're going for you know strong opinions and workshops, yeah. which I think is great. I'm doing one of them. Sort of. Are you? Yeah. Yes. What are you doing? I'm doing. Um, it's called an audience with the world's least successful AI pop star. <laughs> and it's about I I, made, I released two albums last year using this AI music yeah. thing, and it's it's kind of a look how terrible my things have streamed, leading into. But here's why this technology is kind of interesting and it's not oh. a threat to labels. But. Oh, I'm it. using this sort of book if I'm, I'm terrible. So the kind of anti, the, the anti stereotypical man thing of I'm brilliant on stage. Yeah. Just walking around saying, look how. But also, I think the other thing that's, that's not happening now is there was that phase of like, well, we'll get a woman on the panel and then it's not a man on, we're fine. Even that now, I think I see much more events saying we're going to get 50%. And then people to ask about ethnicity now, you know, is it an all white conference? Like, I think you're constantly being challenged. Yeah. And similarly, you know, the board structure. I will say of the kind of the old boys club thing is that I don't think anybody intentionally wrote this script. I just think it came about that way. And then it became a pattern, custom and habit. It just became the way it was. I wanted to be a bit more edgy. And I think representing the independent sector, you need to be constantly on your feet. And so I put in a board rotation structure, which was a first in the industry. And I think it is still unique in the industry. And what it called for was that one fifth of the board would be retired every year and would be ineligible to stand for a year. Which means that every year there are about four places 
for people to come onto the board. And that has meant that AIM has been able to stay contemporary with the changes. And for the people that don't know what AIM is... It's the Association of Independent Music. It's a trade body that... Um, and it covers the musicians and labels and publishers. Anybody that's not one of the corporate players, so not Sony, not Warner, not mm. Universal, and have a copyright. We are representing people who make music. Now, these days, and we should get onto this subject in a minute, this is where the diversity takes a sort of a sharp swerve. Anybody can be a record company, if you like, these days. The diversity now is about choice, and I think it's fantastic. But AIM represented anybody from self-releasing artists through to the largest independent record companies in the world. What it did do was form a collective power and singularity in the industry to effect change because our voices were not being heard. And, you know, if you look at the history of the industry, and it's very interesting that diversity, that is to say plurality, that is to say how many ways can you get into the market, what does the market look like, and what are your opportunities to sell records and get on the radio, you know, went through normal growth through the 50s and 60s and 70s. But funnily enough, the, the invention of the CD and the price hike that went with it started to make really substantial changes in the industry at the corporate level. So we went from being national to multinational to now global. And when you go on that journey, you start to see the industrialization of the music industry and you start to see concentration in the music industry. And concentration is no friend to diversity. Yeah. And I think through the 90s, whereas if you look up to the end of the 80s, the independents had nearly 40% market share. And in that 40%, there were companies like Virgin, Island, A&M, Chrysalis, you know, proud big companies yeah. across the world. Uh, through the 90s, there was this extraordinary concentration through acquisition and merger that went on all the way through the 90s. That when you come into the 2000 era, we started AIM in 90. Nine, so it was a pivotal time to start yeah, something yeah. like this. Napster suddenly breaks. The industry is incredibly concentrated and trying to become even more concentrated. And then Napster breaks like a crate load of chickens being dropped from the sky. You know? <laughs> it's like uh, chickens falling from the sky. Well, to fast track what I'm trying to say, we took such a hit on market share that we were barely scraping 20%. Mm -hmm. So hard. Independence, yeah. yeah. The last win report that we published put us back up to 40%. Yeah, I read that. At copyright level. And that that is the journey that the industry is on now. And I think it's absolutely brilliant mm. that, you know, access to market is diverse. You know, you can choose. You are much smarter these days as an artist. The only thing I would say is don't get hung up with labels. Oh, you know, the record company's dead. And, you know, they're all just labels. What you need is a great team who are into you, into your music, and can provide you with the professional expertise to take the heavy lifting away from your shoulders. Because what I have seen over the years, and all of these things are slight sort of, you know, generalizations and truisms, but I have seen it firsthand that an artist is often burdened if they're trying to also run the admin side of their business. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's tedious. Especially a creative person. <coughs> I, I find invoicing hard enough. So do oh. I. <laughs> oh, so do I, so do I, so do I. Last week I went to this conference, Nylon Connect, which we co-run. And one of the big topics of conversation was, one thing was that, that major labels were kind of saying, we're pulling back a bit, we're coming in a bit later, we'll pay a bit more, we're coming in later. And there was this space for artist development at the beginning. And there's people, there were publishers doing that, there were managers doing that, there were artists putting their own teams independently, yeah. there are companies like Amuse, which is a distributor, but also a label on top of it. Like, suddenly this model of the company that you work with, or the team you work with, you've got all these different choices and yeah. none of them preclude you from doing stuff later on, like signing to a major label, doing Not what you want. All. 
It's really. I mean, you can you can cross the road now. You mm. can you can do you can try different things out, whatever suits you. I mean, Storms is probably quite a good example of that. You know, his early career is fiercely independent, and he he remains an independent with major company mm. money and backing, which for the size of his career, I think is probably what he needs. But. Um, I think success is something that one of my board members many years ago said. Success is in the eye. Success, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. So how do you define success? You know, over the years, running an independent trade association, which is there to help companies to grow and to be successful, I would say to the companies joining AIM, success is about understanding and supporting your artists and paying your bills. And provided you can meet those two goals, then success is a very elastic term in terms of how how mainstream the artists could become, whether their aspirations and ambitions are in that direction or not. Who knows, you know? That's very personal. Mm -hmm. Personal is a nice way to put it. It's very personal. I read the nylon reports. Looked like a a good discussion, a good conversation, but I think Troy... Was it Troy? It was. Talking about the age of the artist, which is what I, I would call where we are now. I think this is the age of the artist. I mean, it's funny that without the artist... Gosh, sounds like a sort of painting, doesn't it? Without the artist, we don't have an industry. Yeah. Without artists, we don't have an industry. Yeah. There is no industry. So it's always been about artists. But I think the last 20 years has been such a learning curve and so many opportunities have opened up that artists are really blessed with choice. Perhaps maybe even a bewildering amount of choice. Mm-hmm. Maybe even a plethora of choice. You know, and I think you said how do you break through when there are 40,000 songs uploaded to Spotify every day? And I think the answer to that is in the same old-fashioned way you always did. You either will or you won't. Uh, It's a crowded market. It's always been a crowded market, but that's down to your team. Being able to to identify your your audience. And the brilliant thing today is that could be anywhere in the world Mm. and you can reach them in a nanosecond. Yeah, that's the brilliant thing. You don't have to be in the big centres. No. Well, we had one of the things at Nylon, I promise not to relentlessly plug my company's conference, but there was a talk from a Chinese company, Kanjian, who one of the partners of ours. I know Kanjian. And they were talking about this, this young Finnish artist uh. who's breaking in China and finding these hundreds of thousands of fans. Um, and they're not very popular in Finland even, but they've just had, they've found this audience see, in China and this is like, there's, there's this diversity of ways to break. You can break in amazing? a random place. So. Isn't that exciting? Mm. You know, I mean, that to me is the most exciting thing of all, that you can find your audience wherever they are in the world. Look at the, um, the way that Cigarettes After Sex, the band, that how they were positioned. I mean, there was never any kind of overt big marketing campaign. Mm. They just went and they played in the countries where their fans were responding well to the music. And they've got these you know, hardcore centres of fans all over the world that has built them into a really, really big, successful band, but in a very traditionally unconventional way. Mm-hmm. You know, push marketing and pull marketing, all that sort of stuff, you know, spend a lot of money and you will break through. Well, I think there's still, there's still a, you know, one should never underestimate the power of the majors mm-hmm. to, to, sure. to really get behind and launch an artist globally. But how many artists can sustain that. Very few, I mm. think. And, um, and then also, I, well, I would think that how many artists, if they really understand what that means, really want that. And how many really want that? How the, the, yeah. whole, the pressure of it, the, yeah. it's a huge job to become a major yeah. star and a major label. Yeah. But this idea of a template for breaking artists, I mean, I feel... Tell me, I'm probably oversimplifying it. You clearly didn't follow it with your AI project. I know. <laughs> it's had about 240 <laughs> streams so far. Um, which oh, I'm kind of, it's a, so I'm, well. I'm quite pleased because I, I feel guilty if I had made an album that I didn't really create and it got. But I don't. And we could go about, talk about the copyright on that. Yeah. Too. Let's yeah. not, eh? Say no. we did. But what, sorry, what, what, is, what name do you release under? Oh, my own, because I was, I was doing it as a, I'm testing this out. I don't have any serious thoughts of making a career out of, of right. AI music. I just wanted to see how it worked. Because the idea you can make AI music and release it onto Spotify was, you know, 
your mind. Yeah, um, it does me too. Because you can, I mean, theoretically, you could program an, uh, an AI machine to um, to record to, to record mm. and to release every single combination of notes that could ever be put together mm. ever in the whole of the universe and then you could claim copyright on it yeah do everyone could you <laughs> that's my future future money making yeah scheme. well that's what they're doing in the um, US thank God. But, but I think um, I mean it's, I feel weird about it because I feel like I meet a lot of musicians and proper musicians who've, uh, you know, so I, I don't I don't sort of um, I'm glad I haven't broken but I guess what I was going to say is I feel like in the olden, the older days of the industry, you could say these are the templates of breaking an artist to do this, and it was yes. a process. Yes. Now, I mean, if you'd said the biggest single last year was going to be a country rap song using a beat bought from a beats marketplace yeah. that went big on TikTok, yeah. like, hey, no one five years ago would know what TikTok was. Yeah. But, and that's just one way a song came to prominence. Yeah. There were all kinds of, like, there have been songs that were big on YouTube first. Yeah. There have been songs that blew up for, like, or that there is no kind of the diversity of ways music can suddenly blow up and find an audience. I know, it's huge. I know. Language also, um, you know, that seems to be melting away as a barrier mm. to success. But I tell you what, I've come to very late in life. What's that shark song? Baby shark. Baby shark. I must be the last person in the world <laughs> to have to have come to baby shark. How did you come to baby shark? Because my four-year-old granddaughter. Um, she, I thought we had it on the telly, and my God, that's catchy. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly catchy. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I said about fifty squillion billion streams. Have on... you seen Baby Shark? No. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a, it's an animation and a song about Baby Shark. <laughs> Not gonna. And Mummy Shark. This doesn't end with me singing it because I'm just And it's Daddy Shark. Thing. Yeah. I think. And it's 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 very catchy. It's kind of Baby Shark do 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 and. It, yeah, it's it's an earworm. It's actually a song that they've animated a visual for. Yeah, yeah. and it's you, an it's an earworm. Stuart's description yeah. is perfect. It's an earworm, but it's a very very catchy earworm. And it's it's on YouTube and it's animated and it's found this audience of kids, like 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 say four or five year old kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. I went to actually last year. This is very much spinning off. Maybe it's a music allies Christmas social thing. We always do a thing for our dinner. We went to the pantomime. Yeah. Did you come with us or? No, um, it was no. on the Friday. I think it when was, uh, yeah. we, we couldn't get tickets. Yeah, so we went to Pantomime and they did that a baby shark moment because they had a topical. So my whole team <laughs> were doing the baby shark and there's a dance that goes with it. There's a dance, well. okay. Oh, dance yeah, where you can yeah, yeah, be a yeah, shark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the biggest hits of last year too, and I think yeah. you said how that came through. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly out there, isn't it? But the old pat, the old template, as you say, for 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 releasing an artist mm. and establishing a worldwide audience, it can be a whole range of different influences now mm. and different influencers now. Mm. I think you said, you know, some of the dynamics of streaming, e.g. playlists and the importance oh, yeah. of skips and influencing recommendations working against diverse music in some ways. I mean, is difficult or not immediately catchy music hampered? So we're looking now at maybe the barriers to entry in an age where, you know, the attention span is shortening and people can just make instant decisions about whether they like something or they don't like something but I thought about that whether that was a barrier Mm. and I think at the baby shark level no it's not (laughs) because obviously baby shark is instantly catchy uh, in the same way that the Spice Girls were instantly catchy so I think up to a certain age probably about 12 or 13 yes a great deal of influence Mm. can be applied from from marketing and positioning that determines that you're going to have a you know a fantastic success with this artist or that artist but i observe this with my own kids and with their friends and with um the the younger companies that were you know, companies run by young people that were members of aim and and win that around the age of sort of 12 13 14 kids like to start to differentiate themselves mm. they start to pull away and that's where independent music i think starts to get in to mm. get their foot onto the ladder mm. because certainly independents don't have the money and neither do they have the inclination 
to break an artist to be a worldwide success overnight or mm. within five or six months or whatever. But the kids tend to change and they like to pull away. People like to be alternative, they like to be different. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the success of the independent sector now in the streaming market, when I think it took some people by surprise. I think there was a view, I know Mark Mulligan and I talked about this a lot, that the independents would simply not have enough commercial traction to maintain uh, market share as consumption increased. The idea being that early adopters were obviously music aficionados and their taste would naturally lean towards a more diverse repertoire, therefore the independents would enjoy you know, healthy market share, but as the number of streamers grew, that market share would drop. And actually, the opposite has happened, mm. which is really interesting. It is. Because I, I think about how I personally listen to music. I feel like I listen to a much wider range of music now than I did in the late CD downloads era. <laughs> because there was a barrier, I suppose, of buying it. But yeah. also, the whole instantness of now, of someone saying, have you heard blah, 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 Oh, I'll go and check them out, it's two clicks. Or the fact that we have these personalised playlists funneling stuff at us, which I still quite like when I get a terrible week on Discover Weekly on Spotify, for example. Uh -huh. you know, I feel like it doesn't know me. The algorithm hasn't let me yet. Yeah. I feel quite proud of myself. Yeah. But I've discovered some brilliant bands that I would too. simply never have found. Me too. Because either a person mentioned them to me or an algorithm chucked them at me. And it can be over, I feel like sometimes there's music going past my nose but yeah. there was things I'm missing that I would love yeah but at the same time I feel like this this net the things I listen to and the styles and the the sources like you can sometimes yeah. find an artist on one of these none of those tracks and we'll talk about tracks in a minute because mm. I think there is a problem here but mm. we'll talk about it in a minute but none of those tracks would have ever made it onto the shelves of mm. WH Smith or Wolves yeah, or our prize or HV. Right. they would never have made it onto Radio 1 or Radio 2 or Capital Radio <laughs> so in fact there was a massive structural barrier to hearing music that you would have loved and that music's always been around you've never had the opportunity mm. to be introduced to it and that's the great thing about streaming is it's a relatively non-existent barrier to experiencing music at a cost which is negligible because you pay your monthly subscription so you don't think about it as a cost it's an experience it's an ex experiential is that right have i got the mm -hmm. right word there yeah, ha. yeah. see yeah. Ah, there you go <laughs> uh, but it, it comes with that package so you just think oh, i'll give it a go i'll give it a go and every one in what one in five one in ten songs you go god that's fantastic and the other four aren't too bad either but where i think the problems come in in this this environment of discovery is stickability is mm. knowledge of the artist to really get engaged with the artist do you for example when you come across a really great song do you then drill down I'm a nerd, so I do. I, I, I understand the question, the, the problem. So yeah, I tend to, if I find someone brilliant, I tend to like the song, add it to my collection, go and see what else they've got out, look at their profile page. But that's a lean forward music fan behavior. Yeah. Like if you're just listening on a smart speaker and you don't even know who it is. Like, oh, like, that's what <laughs> I'm concerned about mm -hmm. because that pattern of consumption whilst it's very healthy and um, a treasure, treasure trove. How are we going to get the headliners of tomorrow at Reading mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. out? Okay. That is the issue, isn't it? It is the issue. If it's just, if you just listen to an artist once and then you don't even know who it is, but you kind of like them, it goes on to the next song, the next song. Yeah. How do you get the ones yeah. standing up? We are going to have to pause the conversation there as we've come to the end of the first of two episodes titled Diversity with Alison Wynnum and Stuart Dredge. This episode was recorded at The Joint, the central London rehearsal studios. For more information, please visit thejoint.org.uk. You'll be listening to the Sync Lodge podcast series Exploring Music. My name is Lionel Lodge, and I thank you very much for joining us. Till next time.